Hello, Keith Kaiser here again with another study in God's Holy Word, and we're looking into Matthew 16, a tremendous passage in the Gospel according to Matthew, where the Lord's deity has been very clearly proclaimed. As Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the Lord, of course, explains that this is really the crux of what the church is going to represent, the true identity of the Lord Jesus. So when you ask, what's the mission of the church? It is to represent the Lord Jesus Christ, to hold forth his truth. We are the pillar and ground of the truth, according to 1 Peter 3.15. In other words, we hold up and display God's truth as it's been revealed through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Christians are to be Christ's men and women, Christ's boys and girls, people that are loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ. We've repented of our sins and put our faith in him, and we trust in him alone, therefore, to save us. That's the only hope of salvation we have. And having been born again through his spirit, that spirit indwells us, and he leads us into truth. And so we look at Matthew 16, verse 20, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. Now, if this church he's going to build is going to represent the Lord Jesus Christ on earth, if it is going to be all about declaring the Lord, and beware of churches that don't talk about the Lord Jesus Christ and focus on him. I mean, it's so easy to make the Lord Jesus a peripheral figure, to put him on the sidelines. In other words, we talk about hopeful things and good things and kind of a nice hallmark kind of thought to encourage people and tell people how nice they are or how good they are or how they ought to be good. We can preach what some theologians describe therapeutic moralistic deism. In other words, we don't believe there's, uh, we do believe there's a God. We're not atheistic, but we're more deistic. We think God's not all that involved in the process. We kind of do the matter of religion. We do the matter of worship and praise, and we go through all the activities, and we should be politically and socially involved, and we should be helping people with their needs. And oh yeah, every once in a while we bring the Lord in if we really need help. No, when we read the New Testament, it was all centered around the Lord Jesus Christ. He was in the midst of them, as he will say in Matthew 18, 20. He's the central figure. When John, an apostle of our Lord Jesus Christ, saw him in his vision on the island of Patmos in Revelation 1, he looked and saw seven golden lampstands. Seven golden lampstands, excuse me. These represented local churches. And then he says, I looked and in the midst was one like the Son of Man. So where did he see the Lord Jesus Christ? He saw him walking in the midst of his churches. And that's where the Lord Jesus ought to be seen. We ought to be holding him forth front and center. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be, as Jacob on his deathbed, whose name was changed to Israel, he prophesied that in Genesis 49. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Of course, that's not just for the church. There's a future sense in which the 12 tribes of Israel will embrace that, and through them, the nations, too, will come and learn of the Lord. But well, that's another sermon, as they say. So if that's the case, if the church is all about the Lord Jesus Christ, if we are to proclaim Christ, if we are to be like Paul and the other apostles saying, we preach Christ and him crucified, or saying, we preach not ourselves, but we preach Christ, not I, but Christ, if that's to be our attitude, why then did the Lord here command the disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ? It's a strange thing, isn't it? He's asked them, well, what do men say that I, who do men say that I am? And they say, well, some say, as we looked at uh, earlier in this passage, they say to him, some say John the Baptist in verse 14, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so, you know, it's not like the Lord is to be equated with mere men, with his servants of the past. These all, in a sense, were preamble to the main subject. The Lord is the Word, as John 1, 1 calls him. And Michael Card wrote a beautiful song called The Final Word about him, when God wanted to display who his son was. Hebrews 1, 1 says, 
in many parts and in many ways, God, having spoken in time past to the fathers in the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us in his Son. So the Lord Jesus is that one who brings us the final revelation. And of course, he, as the risen Christ, passed it on to his disciples, who, as I said at the end of the last lesson, give us the apostles' doctrine of Acts 2.42. They give us the teaching of the risen Christ. So why then command the disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ? Well, as we've seen just at the beginning of this chapter, there was plenty of evidence. There were signs and wonders and miracles that the Lord Jesus had performed, which set forth his messianic credentials. He was one who was doing things that the prophet said Messiah would do when he came, most notably opening the eyes of the blind, but not to be restricted by that. He also gave hearing to the deaf and speech to the mute, cleansing to the leper, healing to the lame and the maimed, and even raised the dead. So the Lord gave ample supernatural evidence of his identity as Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, anointed as prophet, priest, and king, and the Savior come from God, who will sit on the throne of David one day and rule over the nations. The Lord gave plenty of evidence for that, but the evidence was increasingly disbelieved. And we've been watching this phenomenon as far back as uh, Matthew chapter 11, right up to the current point where the Lord keeps doing these things and keeps preaching the word. And by the way, in the Gospel of John, when they come to arrest him, uh, the soldiers go back to the temple authorities empty handed. And they say, why haven't you arrested him? And they said, never a man spake like this man. I mean, no one talks like this man. And Peter would say he was the one who had the words of life. Only the Lord Jesus had such words. So it, for him to command the disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ, at this point, he's not telling them to go forth and proclaim that message. They will be commanded by him to go forth and proclaim that message, but not until Matthew 28. And that's because from this point onwards, and he's about to start prophesying to them for the first time regarding it, he's going to be rejected by the nation. He's going to be delivered up to be tortured and mistreated and ultimately be crucified. And then on the third day, he's going to rise again from the dead. So the Lord has given ample evidence of who he is, that he's the Messiah of God, that he is Lord and Christ, that he's God manifest in the flesh. The Lord has demonstrated that unassailably. There's plenty of evidence out there if somebody wants to know it. The problem is many people like the scribes and Pharisees and Sadducees are playing around. They say they want to know the truth, but they're not really interested. They're only interested in making excuses as to why they haven't believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the Lord's not interested either in adding to the amount of judgment for them. He's going to pronounce tremendous woes against them later in Matthew 23. Nor is he interested in just sort of presenting information out there to people that aren't really interested. You know, he's the one who told us back in the Sermon on the Mount, don't cast your pearls before swine. Nor is he interested in mere hype that results in a lot of human curiosity, but doesn't really lead people to put their faith and trust in him as Messiah. So he tells them, don't tell anybody I'm the Christ, because now the focal point is on going up to Jerusalem for the last time, where the Lord knows he's going to be rejected and he's going to die. And there he's going to lay down his life in sacrifice for sinners. He's going to pay the price that our sins owe. He's going to satisfy the holy and righteous God, his Father, who is the judge of all the earth, in respect to all sin. Jesus will lay down his life as a propitiation for our sins, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Our Lord will do that, and he will give his life in our place if we know him as our Lord and Savior. We can say, he died for me. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, as 1 Corinthians 15 explains it. Now, the Lord, therefore, isn't interested just about publicity or hype. You know, political strategists may say in our day that no publicity is bad publicity, but our Lord definitely didn't agree with that. 
He was going to have them go forth and proclaim him as Christ, but only after his death and resurrection. Then they're told to go forth into all the nations and make disciples of them uh, and teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all things whatsoever that he has commanded them. And he tells them, Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the age. That's how the Gospel of Matthew is going to end. But you notice verse 21. From that time began Jesus to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now already for several chapters now, for a good amount of time, the chief priests and elders and scribes have been plotting to murder the Lord Jesus. They've joined in, as Mark 3 tells us, with the Herodians to oppose Jesus and to scheme to try to bring his demise. But here's the first time where the Lord explicitly tells the disciples that this is going to happen. And he's going to keep repeating this as they get to closer to Jerusalem because he wants them to look back after the fact and see, oh, the Lord wasn't taken by surprise by Judas's betrayal, nor by his arrest, nor by the trial before the Sanhedrin, nor by that before Herod or the one before Pilate. No, all these things the Lord knew ahead of time. And the Lord purposefully walked into this trap. He wasn't taken unawares. This wasn't uh, something that caught him by surprise or was a mere accident of history. This was him being determined, being delivered up rather by the determined counsel and foreknowledge of God as Acts 2 Peter himself would later preach that. So he's now preparing the disciples so that they'll know what's going to happen. And even now they don't fully understand it, as we'll see in a moment. But imagine this, that he began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem. Of course, they knew that, you know, he's going up and from their perspective, he's going to be received by the nation and acclaimed. Surely with all the miracles he's done, with all the multitudes that have followed him, everybody will recognize he's Messiah, the king, and he'll use his power to topple the Romans and give freedom to Israel, and he'll bring in the kingdom of God. And no doubt that's what many of them were thinking. We know because later various disciples like James and John are asking for plum jobs in the kingdom. They're already thinking about the perks of being identified with the Lord. They're not thinking about suffering. And he's going to suffer many things. Notice, not first of all from the Romans, but suffer many things from the elders. Now, as far back as Moses, the elders were supposed to be obviously older people, but people that were mature, people that were wise, people that had walked with God and learned from him and would be able to apply God's word wisely in real life situations. But the elders here aren't going to do that. The elders here, in fact, are going to unwittingly fulfill the scripture by delivering up the Lord Jesus Christ to be crucified. They're not going to stand with Messiah. They're going to oppose Messiah and they're going to ally themselves with his enemies. Likewise, the chief priests, when you think about these men who day after day interacted with that concept of the Levitical sacrifices, the five main categories of sacrifice, burnt offering, meal offering, peace offering, sin offering, and trespass offering, all of which, when you study them in detail, point forward to the sacrifice of Christ. Underlying that whole system is the concept that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins, no remission, as the old translation puts it. And that idea of substitution, of a victim being sacrificed in place of the guilty person, that was, of course, ensconced in that whole Levitical system. And day after day, they had that. They were also to be teaching priests. They were to teach the people the law. So they had the Pentateuch. They also had the writings and the prophets, and they were to teach people the Bible and what it said about Messiah. And so they would know the many passages like Genesis 22, which typologically portrayed that concept of a son being offered, like Abraham offering Isaac on Moriah, albeit God didn't let Abraham kill him. And also they would know the direct prophecies that the prophets would talk about, passages like 
Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 53 and so forth that would speak about the death of the Lord Jesus. And then the scribes, these men who were experts in the Bible because they copied the manuscripts and they were to know it letter perfect. They were to know every single word and to be so careful and they were to be consulted on it. And yet, even though they knew the letter of the law, the letter of the Bible, they didn't obey it. They didn't let the scriptures lead them to faith in the Lord's Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior. Instead, he was going to be killed and be raised the third day. So suffering in the house of his friends, suffering from people who ought to have known better. As John 1 says, he came unto his own things and his own people received him not, as the ESV translates that. And so that terrible thing that having the promises and the scriptures and the covenants and the types and the shadows and all these things that pointed forward to Christ, and yet they missed him because it wasn't mixed with faith. They never believed on the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And that's the danger. It's like the old gospel track. Some people will miss heaven by 18 inches. The distance between your head and your heart, of course. Some people have an intellectual knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the question is, do we have a heart knowledge? Have we submitted our will to the Lord and asked him, my Lord and my God, be merciful to me, a sinner. While Christ is the Savior of sinners and whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The beauty is that you can call on him today and ask him to save you. And the Lord is as good as his word. He will save you. And so we beseech you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Thank you for listening.